Good morning. This is Brian Paul on Let the Bible Speak. Um, for those who have not seen me in a while, I am the preacher of the Escanaba Church of Christ. I'm also uh, the hospice chaplain and all the inpatient hospital chaplain at OSF um, Healthcare in Escanaba. So for those who know me, I'm glad to be able to speak to you the Word of God. We are going to look at the fruit of the Spirit for the next uh, few weeks, probably till roughly uh, the end of the year. We're looking at the fruit of the Spirit. So if you want to turn to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5 is going to be uh, the text that we're going to be in for a couple months. And what we're going to be doing is just looking at Galatians 5 verses 22 and 23. And that is going to be the fruit of the Spirit. Now this morning we are going to uh, jump a little earlier in the text to get a con some context. But for the next few months we're looking at the fruit of the Spirit. Beginning this morning with an introduction with the Holy Spirit and then each week after that looking at one of the fruits. So next week obviously will be love. All right, so let's look at Galatians 5. I'm going to start reading in verse 13. So Galatians 5, verse 13, and we'll read till uh, 26. I know I have 23, but we're going to do 26. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out, or you will be destroyed by each other. So, I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery, idolatry, and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, uh, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh and its passions and desires, with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, um, provoking and envying each other. So that's going to be a very important text for our study. It begins with freedom. It begins with our freedom that we have in Christ. For those who are Christians, before being redeemed by Christ, each of us were slaves to sin. We get more of that in Romans chapter 6. If we were to read Romans 6, you realize that we were enslaved, but then Christ set us free. Christ broke the chains, uh, setting us free from the bondage of sin. So we are free to choose to do whatever we want. We could, and I say that carefully before it, if anyone cringed at that, it's like, hear me out, okay? We are free to choose to either indulge in sin and reap the due consequence, right? Or serve one another and yield to God and produce fruit, all right? God has set us free that we may live a full life from sin being transformed just a little bit more each day by Him working in our lives. And in this lesson, we're going to learn that that is the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. This is where I want to begin, because we could start 
at verse 22 of Galatians 5 and just jump right into love. And next week, start looking at joy. <clears throat> but I want to take a few steps back and talk about the Holy Spirit and how he fits into this equation because it's called the fruit of the Spirit. It's called the fruit of the Spirit. So we have to ask, why? What does the Holy Spirit have to do in this equation? And that's what we're going to learn this morning. So I want to first talk about the identity of the Holy Spirit and, and see how he fits into, if I may say, the Godhead. Or some of you may know the, the term, which I have no issue with, the Trinity, the, the triune in God. Okay, the best way to parse this out without doing a long study is there, you can go endlessly on the study of God the Father, God the Son, and the God the Holy Spirit. And we can go beyond what we can even fathom and comprehend with our own minds. And we can't go that deep because we want to get into the fruit of the Spirit, which is what the study is all about. So we're just going to do a quick, quick couple moments survey of each of the persons of God. <clears throat> the first, we have God the Father. And the best way to picture God the Father is he is in heaven, seated on his throne. Okay, every time we see God, he is in heaven, and everything he does is from heaven. Uh, at times, he did speak to some in the Old Testament verbally. We get that. Uh, most often, we see in the Old Testament the use of angels or prophets. But we always have this idea of God the Father in heaven. Even when Jesus taught his disciples to pray, he starts off, to, he says, this is how you pray. Pray to our Father who art in heaven was in heaven. So the text, as you see in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, we always see God the Father dwelling in heaven. Now, we have God the Son. God the Son. God the Son was present before time and coexisted before the Father. Uh, <laughs> I'm not preaching heresy. He coexisted with the Father and he was there through and during creation. Now, you may be asking, Brian, I need some text to show. I would love to give you all that, but again, we don't have time to dive into this. We're just giving a quick survey of who these different persons of the Godhead are. Uh, so Jesus coexisted with the Father before and during creation creation. And some say he was the fourth person in the fiery furnace with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We don't know for sure, but why not? I have no issue with that. What we do know, <clears throat> what we do know is that Jesus was the incarnate person of God. What that means is he was God in the flesh. The incarnate, whenever you hear the incarnate, some faith groups don't really jump on words like that, but the incarnate is God in the flesh. In John chapter 1, the first three verses, the Apostle John recorded, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. Then John continues in verse 14, The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. So we get this idea that Jesus, he is God. He always was God, but Jesus is God becoming flesh. Simply put, Jesus was God in the flesh. Now, they both are one, but they are also separate. Now, I am okay saying that we cannot fully understand this. And if you say, oh, I fully got it. Well, that's awesome. I'm glad for you, but I'm okay saying that this is bigger than me. You know, we have examples. I know a lot of preachers use the illustration of an egg, and different preachers use different illustrations. But I, I read a, a book. I forget who the artist or the author was, but... He just put it out there and said, we have these illustrations, but none, none give us a full comprehension of what this Godhead looks like, of Jesus being a separate entity of God, but yet being God fully also. 
I can't quite put my mind around that, and that is okay. And that's why I worship him, because he's so much bigger than something I can put on the shelf. You know, he's so much bigger. Okay, so that's God the Son. Basically, it's God in the flesh. Anytime we see God walking on the earth in the fleshly form, we called him Jesus. Okay? Now, God the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit, the person of the hour. The Holy Spirit is the very presence of God. That's the best way to parse it out. The very presence of God. When God came to earth in the fleshly form, he was called Jesus. We just looked at that. But whenever God, not in the flesh, was actively working on the earth, rather be transforming, guiding, giving strength, <clears throat> excuse me, empowering, raising the dead, he was called the Holy Spirit. All three are one, but they also are separate in ways, again, that I believe we cannot fathom. I have some good articles. I, if you are interested in, in just a little bit deeper dive, like I said, I can't go too deep because this is bigger than, than any of us, but I did write some, I believe, some good articles helping parse this out and understand the unity, but also the separate persons of the Godhead. And if you are interested in reading any of those, um, let us know. I would love to send those to you, and of course, we're not going to charge you. They're just an article. Oh, send, send to email. All right. So the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, from the beginning, I want to start at the uh, best place to start. We're going to uh, dive now into the Holy Spirit a little deeper. We see the Holy Spirit during the days of creation. Genesis 1, the first two verses. Genesis 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Many people know that. Kids know that verse, Okay. Um, but the next verse has so much life. It says, Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. The Spirit of God. We have this image of during the creation, while God was setting the foundations of the earth, there the Holy Spirit, God's Spirit, was actively working. Remember how I told you that God, the Father, always resided in heaven, and Jesus was the fleshly form of God when he walked. Anytime you have God working on the earth, not in the flesh, it was the Holy Spirit. And I get that even from the second verse in the Bible. There God is actively working on the earth. It is his Spirit. When there was nothing, God spoke and the Holy Spirit crafted everything that is. And this is so vital to remember, okay, because this transforming, creative power of our God. Hold on to that idea, because when we get a little further into this lesson and start talking about the fruit of the Spirit, realizing that the Holy Spirit who dwells within us if we are a Christian, is the same Spirit that crafted the universe into being. And so if you say, well, I can't change. I don't know how God can change. It's like God created the universe through the work and the power of his Holy Spirit. I think whatever you are struggling with, if you yield to God, I think he's got it. I think he can take care of it. Oh, the power of God within us if we yield to him. All right, so moving on from, from creation, I just wanted to start there because that's a beautiful idea. Knowing that, that same power of God within you, who wants to transform you, was transforming the world a few thousand years ago. As we move into the Old Testament, I want to show you a couple of things in the Old Testament. Throughout the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit worked powerfully. Um, upon men and women like Moses, Joshua, Deborah, Samson, uh, David, and even King Saul on, on one occasion. Now, it's important to realize that these were temporary moments when the Holy Spirit would come upon or even just call me in a person, but temporary. He didn't dwell with them continuously as we see um, today through the work of the redemption through Christ. 
as a very temporary thing when God the Holy Spirit would come upon the people. Joel, however, in Joel chapter 2, verses 28 through 32, Joel prophesied that there would come a day when the Spirit of God would be poured out on all people. And uh, we see this fulfillment in the New Testament. We're going to get to that in, in just a moment. But in the Old Testament, we have the Spirit, again, be, just being poured on people, temporary, just a temporary presence of God, working through, working in, working amongst the people. But then in the New Testament, God says, I want to give you the Spirit. I want Him to dwell within you. So now moving into the New Testament, Jesus did speak of this in John 14. Um, we're not going to dive into John 14, but if you want to see an amazing introduction to the Holy Spirit by Jesus himself, near the end of the time, his time on earth, Jesus uh, said, hey guys, I'm not going to be able, able to stay here with you forever. I would love to. I would love to just stay here, hang out with you. But he did his work. And he was going to complete his work through the cross. So he told him, I don't want to leave you alone. I'm going to leave you the Holy Spirit. And he continues through John 14 to talk about the Holy Spirit and how he's going to advocate for us and how the Spirit's going to be what has, <coughs> I'm so sorry, and uh, a work in us, okay? Uh, Romans 8, verse 11, we learned that it was the Holy Spirit that even after Jesus, uh, he, he died and he was in the grave, Romans 8, 11 says that it was that Spirit that raised Christ from the dead. Now, that verse continues to say that if that same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwell in you, he will quicken your body. And of course, we're talking about what happened on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2, where the, the spirit wants to indwell us. That's salvation. He wants to live on us. It's the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead. He wants to raise us from the dead spiritually. spiritually. And it was the same spirit that created the heavens and the earth. Who is the Holy Spirit? He is the person and power, the presence of God active on the earth today but not simply on the earth. Uh, the, if I could say the baptism of the Holy Spirit is when God, His Spirit, not only comes upon us, as He did in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament and forward now to us New Testament Christians. The Holy Spirit wants to dwell within us. God wants to dwell within us. Jesus said in John 14, 20, this is, again, Jesus giving us an introduction to the Holy Spirit. He says, On that day you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. And you just let that process for a minute. Realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. It's such a beautiful unity. You don't see that in the Old Testament. Like I said, in the Old Testament, you just see the Holy Spirit jumping on, um, coming on, being poured on a person temporarily to do something phenomenal. Like Samson, the Spirit came and he had this phenomenal strength, you know, or he came on King Saul and Saul started to prophesy. Just temporary times, but what we see as we come into the New Testament is God saying, I actually want to dwell within you. I want to be one with you. I want you to be one with me. And that happens through God being in our lives through the redemption of Jesus Christ. John 14, 23, um, a little later, Jesus replied, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love him, them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Now, I, I need to take a moment to parse this out because you need to listen to the pronouns in there. This, this verse is phenomenal. It says, anyone who loves me and obeys my teaching. Okay, we've, we've heard about, you've heard me talk about obeying the gospel, and we're going to look at that in a few moments here. Obeying the gospel, doing what God asks you to do, okay, and um, uh, surrendering your life, confessing, repenting, um, being baptized. These are things that God wants us to do. And it says, if anyone 
who obey my teaching will also live in faithfully. Okay, we cannot forget that. He says, my Father will love them. Okay, now Jesus is talking. Now, my Father will love them. His Father in heaven, okay? And we, who is the we? Well, it's Jesus. He, all, he brought in the context of his Father. And the context of John 14 is the Holy Spirit. If they obey my teaching, my Father will love them, and we, the entirety of God, okay, will come to them and make our home with them. That is beautiful. That's what Paul would call reconciliation in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. The reconciliation, the goal ever since the fall from the garden, God being able to reside with, but not only with, but within his people through redemptive work of Christ. Now, we talked about the Holy Spirit from creation. We've talked about the Holy Spirit <clears throat> in the Old Testament. We've talked about the Holy Spirit, the introduction by Jesus. But now I want to bring it home and talk about how this all started. And we have to go to Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost. We're not going to read through it. I actually am working through the, the book of Acts in our uh, Sunday morning series at, um, in Escanaba. We do record our sermons, so if you're like, you know, I want to know more about what happened on that day, let me know, and I can get you that recording. We, we video the, uh, the Sunday morning sermons. But in Acts chapter 2, the people were waiting in the upper room <laughs> And we know how it goes, the room, um, a, a mighty rushing wind in tongues of, uh, like a fire, was resting over each of them. And then they all started to speak in other languages, but what we did not see with our physical eye, what they didn't see is the Holy Spirit rushing and dwelling within each and every one of them. And that is what we call the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That is the beginning of God saying, this is it. This is how I want it to be. I want to live within you. I want to be a part of your life, but you have to obey the gospel. Now, looking at that day and how the chapter continues, many of the Jews previously, we know, rejected Christ. And they saw Peter, and Peter responds to them and tells them, Hey guys, uh, so Peter tells these guys in Acts chapter 2 that, they, that Jesus was the Messiah. Jesus was the Messiah, but they killed him, okay? Peter told them that even though they rejected him, God had made this Jesus Lord. Peter told them that Jesus had raised from the dead, and now he was sitting on his throne in heaven. Now, as we see the chapter progress, that is where verse 36 comes. And then 37, the people, after hearing this, it says that they were cut to the heart. One gets the idea that they, that they were starting to believe and realize that Jesus was, was Lord. So they asked Peter, what must we do? What do we have to do to fix this? If you want forgiveness, and if you want the Holy Spirit, as we see in the next couple of verses, Peter says you need to repent and be baptized. Because what we have here is the people who were beginning to believe and they understood that they had to confess, make Jesus Lord. And Peter says, if you want to finish the deal, if you want forgiveness, if you want the Holy Spirit in your life to repent and be baptized in water, and you will receive this amazing gift. And 3,000 people turned to God that day. That's salvation. That is salvation right there. The question now is, what happens when the Spirit of the Almighty God dwells in your heart. Because we just brought it to, now we know this amazing spirit from creation. We brought him forward and now we know how to get him, God, in our lives. We, we believe, we um, make Jesus Lord of our lives. We repent, we're baptized in water. That's exactly how it happened for them. Now if we obey the gospel, we can have the spirit of God in our lives as well. Now what? That, my friend, is when transformation starts. That's when fruit starts. How can we possibly have the amazing Almighty God living within 
our lives and not change, and not change. Galatians chapter 5, I want to read it again. Now that we got some context, now that we got <clears throat> uh, a, a good introduction on the Holy Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, what God wants to do in your life, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. These virtues, these things are the core nature of our God. And as we live as Christians, we start off as babes, but then we allow and yield to God and allow Him to start working in our lives. And these are the things that we slowly should start to grow. That is why this series is, I, this is Christian maturity, growing in God, Christian maturity. God wants to transform each and every one of us. I think this is a good place to start. Read this list this week. Next week, we're going to be looking at um, love and how God wants to work love into our lives. I want to tell you real quickly about some resources we have to grow. We have a seven-part series. Uh, these lessons will help you grow. They start with just learning about God and learning how to become a Christian. And if you want to check them out, let us know. We'll send you them for free. We also have a, a Bible, ESV. I use the, King, uh, the uh, NIV. These are ESVs. Um, and we'll send you this hardcover ESV for free just to help you grow. Um, some of our contact info, uh, you can reach out to us at Marquette Church of Christ, uh, P.O. Box 372, Marquette, Michigan, 49855, www.letthebiblespeak.net. Um, and also, I don't know if they have the slides anymore, but I also wrote a few books um, that uh, you can find on Amazon. But if you want one of my books, um, you can reach out to me, um, and I would love to send um, these books to you. I will be praying for you. I ask that you run to God and say, God, how can I change? How do you want to change me? Thank you so much for tuning in. You have a blessed week. God bless you.